Okay. It was cold this morning. Where am I? Thing. Let me check the temperature. Hey, darling, how, how do I don't know if I look good. How do I look good with this? Hey. Oh, you can always wear this little winter hat, must. Yeah, this. Yeah, let me have my. The one with the flaps. Yeah, let me let me have the winter hat. The Eastern Cape hat. Throw it. Mm. Throw it. Throw, throw, go ahead. I catch it. Whoa. I used to be a semi-athlete when I was young, but I don't have any hand-eye coordination, so baseball wasn't my thing. It was track and actually high bar. Anyway, so I just put this on. I don't like this thing. It's Eastern Cape way. It's the Eastern Cape hat that was made for me in Cape Town, actually. You know. A lot of people in Cape Town, Joburg, and places, all, they all come from the Eastern Cape. But wait a second, what what temperature is it? Man, this is this is not good, man. It's it's cold. It's cold. Here we are supposed to be, I don't know. How you say this? I guess it's going into autumn. Yeah, we were, we were just we were just through with summer. So I wonder how much what's the degrees? Fifteen light rain, fifteen gonna be up to twenty one degrees Celsius. Twenty one is not that. Whatever. Oh. Hey, look, this might be a longer, this is going to be a, a longer thing because there's something I have to get through. A whole uh, military thing. It has to do with cycle, with, um, so I'm really into, into like cycles and patterns and stuff like that. And this whole phenomenon of what happens in, 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 in the world for real. But let me start off by saying this. Um, I listen to Yvette Cornell, you know, twice a week and, you know, uh, like that. And, of course, she has a regular call of callers that I like the corners. Uh, I don't call it because I'm here in South Africa. It costs too much money. I guess when I get to the States, I might, like, I don't know if I have a question or like that. But one of the callers, a regular, uh, Alexander, Alexander the Great, um, he had said something one time that, uh, well, I've had this philosophy for a long, long time. He says, always leave the light on. Meaning, like, you know, if you're in a hotel or whatever, leave the light on so people, you know, it goes back to the, book, the green book days, you know, you, you had the light, light on, you, you, you know, this was the place, you had the, when your book, this was the place, you know, the, and then you, you go to that place, that who sent you, that, 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 that whole thing. So always leave the light on, and what that means is that you never know, you know, what's, when somebody will turn back your way. So one of the things about Neely Fuller Jr., when he talks about his compensatory code, which I keep on telling you, you don't need to get this book. Uh, every Remember, one of the things that, uh, one of the many things, many wise things that Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. says in his uh, independent, uh, the independent compensatory uh, code system concept, you know, the little textbook there, workbook, you know, for thought, speech, and action uh, by Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. This is the original one that I had bound, but you know, you can get the updated version, whatever have you. Go to producejustice.com, get a little commercial with Neely Fuller Jr. Very important book. But one of the things, it says, it's, uh, you know, just don't call nobody no names. And now, a lot of people profess to be followers. You really fool you. They, they miss that part. They like to, we all like to call everybody a name. But I, I don't particularly like to do that. I mean, I, I, I know I've, I've created a name, at least a little neo, neo Negro name. I like that one. Um, I won't show it to you right now. Well, like I said, it's going to be a long one. Um, but one of the things that fascinates me is that if, you, if, if somebody like, say, uh, Clarence Thomas, okay? Now, Clarence Thomas, one of the things he, he has said, I heard him say this, was that, you know, he owes nothing to, to uh, um, affirmative action, you know, which is a blatant, come on, hey, I don't know what history books you've been reading, but, so I'm going to go to my own personal experience with affirmative action, what I call the system and stuff like that, but before I do that, I just want to point out one thing, because we're in what's called a, um, a second of um, McCall, McCall, uh, the MacArthur era, you know, the, the congressman from the 50s or whatever have you, uh, you know, it's like the MacArthur 2.0 or 3.0, whatever, whatever it is, I guess we've gone through a couple of times. But one of the things that was, was response, remember, I'm an audio dramatist, and, and basically means that I'm a theater person, put it out, theater and a radio person. But one of the greatest theater things I think was ever done as far as activism and stuff like that came from that, that, that MacArthur era field uh, time. Um, one of Marilyn Monroe's husbands, Arthur Miller, playwright, famous playwright, right? Respect that guy so much because when he was going through that 50s thing, his, his, his whole approach was like, yeah, I could write about this whole MacArthur era right now, and, and that would be fine. Um, I'm not saying this is what he said, but this is what I'm saying that he said. 
but he's got to do something else that would that that, that distance yourself from because everything becomes too personal when you know like like you see somebody there and you say oh that and you call that person a name you know because they're real life people and people you know especially in this day of media age they, 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 they keep on sniping that same person that person like gives up or look it gets more entrenched you know and again Clarence Thomas is a perfect example where he says affirmative action blah 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 when he was going through his thing because of the time period remember the Joe Biden committee I call the Joe Biden committee and it was something else but the Joe Biden committee with the judicial kind of thing he was on it and uh, when Clarence Thomas when he was about to you know try to call some more women as far as this guy is uh, <laughs> he, he, he pulled that this is a this is a, a high tech lynching or whatever he call it going back to you using that blackness that he had even though he he Firmly said he wasn't doing the, the, he wasn't doing the firm act or the blackness thing because when you say doing firm act that's blackness to me you know and plus remember Clarence Thomas used to be a diehard you know uh, Malcolm follower follower of Malcolm X I'm not you know well, a lot of us were okay a lot of us still are uh, so anyway so we get through all that stuff so he he's playing that race thing you know and then at the same time denying the race thing so you can call him a bunch of names but he's on the Supreme Court don't just leave 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 the man alone. I started to say, leave the boy alone. Leave the man alone. Um, but back to Arthur Miller. So what he did, he wrote this play called The Crucible. And it was about the Salem witch trials. And the just was Salem, you know, back in the, you know, whatever, 16, you know, the, whatever, 1600s, 1700s, whatever it is. Right? And uh, it's just 1600. And that, that, that situation perfectly showed um, what was happening in the MacArthur era, right? So it's like the same, and I must say the same thing. Now, pe people, do, I'm trying to be more accurate, more personal, but I'm having, like I'm being personal right now because I'm, I'm going to give you this whole thing about the military and my adventures in the military, which is very long. So, so t that's what I want to say. So, so all us, all us are creative people, you know, as, 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 as the scholars talk about what they, what, what they talk about ADOS, and as the pundits talk about what they, ADOS, as this, whatever, the, the, like that, that. The artists, uh, our poets, uh, 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 all our artists, our, our poets, our, our comedians, everything like that, they should be, you know, dealing with the perspective. But I say, look at, look, don't, don't be literal. Look at it artistically. Put it in some other frame. You know what I mean? I mean, um, I just heard that um, you know, the the, the uh, hip hopper uh, 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 Nipsey Russell uh, just, just just was shot up. You know, from whatever beef he had, but that even that thing, you know, if you do it accurately, what it, what it is today, you know, you come up with certain things. But if you put it in another time frame, another kind of thing, using the same kind of circumstance, you'll see. You know, you, you, it might be a better illumination, but I'm, but I don't know anything about this. His whole, Nipsey uh, Hustle, I should say, and his whole his whole thing. Um, thinking about the comedian Nipsey Hustle. Anyway, so let's go on you know, to what I want to really talk about today. And it's 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 it really starts with uh, I when I started voting um, I couldn't vote at 18 because it was you couldn't vote 21 was the voting age when I went into the service at at, uh, at 18 uh, so I couldn't vote you know and but they changed it while I was in the service to an 18 year old could vote because they say why would you serve your country if you can't vote it doesn't make any sense see so um, so my first electoral thing was actually in 72. Right, uh, so so that, that's what happened. There. But how did I get in the military? Especially with my training, I was in a revolutionary group, a little study group that we knew all about the, the, uh, the system, knew all about revolution. We knew all about the military because we were trained by two military, two Vietnam veterans that was veterans in like '64. Well, they were like served in Vietnam for like '64. You know what I mean? So they were they were they knew this sort of whole scheme of how things um, developed. So why would a person like that who's had a lot of training and all kinds of things? Why would a person like that have to go in the military? Well, at the time, you see, we had this thing called a lottery, you know. And uh, lottery was they put your birthday in the, in, the, in the drum, you know, 365 or whatever it is, and put it around and they pull it out and then whatever, and they put you up like you get number, number one through, you know, 360, whatever. I think it was now, I was like 115, you know, my, at the time. Now, 115 said, well, that's a pretty big number. It's not a little big number. Big, it was not a really big number, especially where I was coming from because I was in the South Bronx, which basically means that, remember, it was called each draft board, they call them draft boards at the time, had a certain amount of people in their draft thing. But in my, excuse, excuse me, area of the South Bronx, well, a lot of us, a lot of people were dead in jail, blah, blah, basically ineligible. So my little 115, you know, it might as well have been number one or number 15. 
So I was gone, you know, so the, the army was coming to get me. So I was thinking, Mmm, more herb thing. This is the herb one. Baby, what you got in this tea? It's the Rasta herb tea. Oh, the Rasta herbs. Okay, good. Rasta herbs. I hang out. I, I respect the Rasta. I tell you, no, I tell you right now. The Rasta is kind of interesting because to me, they're the only universal group, the group that's all over the world. A little, at least their philosophy, and it doesn't change. Just like the Chinese all over, presence all over the world. The Rasta community have presence all over the world. So I hang out with the Rastas because wherever I go on the planet, I can hang out with some Rastas. You know, I know a lot about their culture and go to Tabernacle and all that sort of stuff. But back to the point, Rastas are not. So, so that particular point, you know, hey, if you was like, uh, I did, but you were going, you were going to the service. Now with the army, it was like this. You'd be, you'd be hanging out with your boys in one, one day, and then, you know, six weeks later, after being trained at Fort Dix or wherever you was being trained at, you'd be in the, you know, in the jungles of Vietnam fighting, having some fight with a 13-year-old that you had no beef with, you know, hence the, the Malcolm X, the Malcolm X, the, the um, uh, Muhammad Ali saying about, you know, I, no, 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 uh, no Vietnamese ever called me nigga and I'm not going to fight them, blah, 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 uh, which is an incredibly bold and good statement to, to, to make at the time. Um, much more than any statements have been made ever since, actually, going up against the U.S. military. Okay, so 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 somebody like me go into the army, end up six weeks later fighting in Vietnam. Uh, you could uh, take the test for the um, uh, for the I think the Navy had a test. Yeah, the Navy I think they had a test. Uh, but like my brother, who was a merchant marine. He told me, now you don't want to go to the Navy because if you was on the ship, remember, it's like uh, 50, if there's 15, you know, thousand people on the ship, there's only like 25 black people. Donna, and surprisingly enough, a lot of people in the Navy came from the South. For some reason, they put them in, they put them in the Navy. Then, of course, if you was in the, uh, the uh, went to volunteer for the um, for the Marines, hey, that's just their mission is 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 is, is to kill them, <laughs> kill them. That's their sort of like mission. So you again, you'd be fighting. You'd, you'd be fighting, banging a gun. So a lot of people, unbeknownst to me, because the Air Force was a small, was the was was the more difficult test. I don't know what they did with the with the Coast Guard or something. If I, I don't think they came under. They, I don't know what they came under. Uh, so, so you could go into the uh, to if you took a test for the Air Force. Their mission is to keep them flying, keep them flying, keep them flying, keep them flying. So if you wasn't a pilot, hey, you support. So a lot of people, unbeknownst to me, like me, who are, I'm not saying I'm small, I'm pretty smart, isn't that? Like a little bit above the, 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 the mean, whatever, the edge there. And uh, so we took the test with the Air Force, figuring, like, hey, keep them flying, that's not me. Well, unbeknownst to me, a whole lot of other people that had degrees and everything was taking tests with the Air Force because they didn't want to, like, like a lot of people run off to Canada or Europe or whatever have you, or, or go to jail or, you know, draft dodge or whatever you want to call it. For whatever reason, I think I was just, uh, I don't know why I did it. I was, I was trained to, the, 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 you know, the great spirit, you know, the great mystery said, hey, this is the path you're going to take. Anyway, so I ended up in the Air Force. Now, again, you know, uh, it was kind of interesting because when I was in the Air Force, this was like 1970, I went into the Air Force, right after seeing the um, Band of Gypsies at the, uh, you know, a couple of weeks after seeing the Band of Gypsies at the Fillmore East. Band of Gypsies, you know, Jimi Hendrix and, and Cox, you know, Buddy Miles. I was really into Jimmy. I was into Buddy Miles. Anyway, that's not the point. So I'm up here now in the Air Force. Hey! Now, uh, now I remember, I grew up in a cadet corps, so the military training it was nothing to me. I knew all about that. It's, it's little, little to me. All I wanted to do was, like, get out. Do my four years and get out. You know, so people were worried about the jobs. They want to get more of this stuff. No, I wasn't worried about none of that stuff. But let me tell you about uh, uh, the, basically the second my little adventures in the Air Force first of all you know when you get there the, 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 this is a, your basic training then they have to assign you to the, to the food lines you know to KP you know to, 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 um, the kitchen patrol you know what you doing so the guy looked at me and said you're on salads you put me over to the salads which is like the easiest job. I didn't know it at the time. So I'm up here to make, I learned how to make salads and, you know, the presentation is everything. It was great. You know, I mean, the other people want pots and pans. They want all kinds of things, but salad was an easy job. So, so that was good. I, hey, that's fine. Um, but before I got to that, I didn't know. It was about this, 
No, yeah, but the, so the salad, that was my first job. Then a few days later, you know, uh, maybe the first day we got our hair cut. You know, I forget what the, 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 the sequence of events. Um, we got our hair cuts, you know, because you gave, and it, it's funny when you, everybody, if you cut everybody's hair at the same time, they all look, look like, hey, similar, you know, similar, you know, black, white, you know, Puerto Rican, everybody just a freaking, everybody looks the same, okay. So that's what happened. Ooh, it's raining out now. It's a miserable day. Anyway. So, so, uh, so when I got back to the barracks, I looked at myself in the mirror and said, I don't like this haircut. So I went and took my shave and stuff and I just shaved my head bald, right? A couple of other brothers in there, they're doing like, yeah. So they just shaved their heads too. Now, I'm not a big one. I'm not a, I'm not that kind of leader, you know what I mean? So I wasn't paying any attention, you know? So a day later or something like that, we were allowed, maybe it was the same day. We were all out in the smoking area. They had a little smoking patio, smoking cigarettes. I was, I was 20 at the time. I smoked the time from was 9 to 22 years old. So I was still smoking at the time. So now, you, when you had when you had your your drill sergeants, whatever you want to call them, I forgot what we called ours, tech sergeant. I don't know what we call them. But you, know, you only had two. You usually had two, and you had a good like a good cop bad guy. You had a good sergeant and bad sergeant. You know they come at you and either way. They get you right. So the good, the, you know, the kind sergeant, you know, came into our smoking area. There's a bunch of brothers around, you know. And so he comes, and, he, and we all straight up. He said, no, 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 relax, you know, at ease, at ease, at ease, you know. Uh, and he lights a cigarette, too. He says, no, it's a, uh, so notice you, you, you fellas, you uh, shaved your head, and so, I said, well, who's the blah, blah, blah. Everybody looked around, nobody said anything. Everybody knew it was me, you know. And uh, so I said, well, let me, let me, I'm not accusing anybody anything, but let me tell you a little story. Since when I was in Spain, there was a guy, this white guy, that's what he said, like that. He's a white guy. And he went and got drunk one time, and he lay, and he passed out on the beach, and he got sunburned, and they put him up for a court martial. So we're looking at, really, you know, hey, yeah, he put him up for a court martial. Why? Well, because he got sunburned. And you may not know, but GI I mean government issue. You're a GI, you're a government issue. You belong to the government. That's what he said. He said, so when this guy had this sunburn, he, he was grew up on Cormash for damaging government property. Damaging government property. And so, and so, look, the upshot was this. Like, so he was saying that point just to get our attention at the but he wanted to find out if this was, if us cutting our hair, you know, a ball, right, was a movement, some kind of movement. Because outside, remember, this is like 1970, so you still, the Panthers were still going, right? You would come out have, you just had all the, you know, from 68, whatever, you all had all those, you know, those upheavals, you know, in, 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 in the cities, in, in the cities, you had the NAACP, all, all people saying they blah, 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 all kinds of things. So they thought that. So I guess somebody must have thought that I had started this movement in the Air Force against, you know, against the government. Let's put it that way. No, no, so I said, da, 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 da. Well, I just wanted to tell you about blah, 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 And he left. Went through basic training. It was like six weeks, something like that. The day before you graduate, you know, because if you, you could get set back and you had to be set back in another six weeks, man. Of course, I wasn't. You know, I mean, it's like I was... I was like the second fastest runner in our group, you know. I was on JV in, in high school, whatever. you know. Uh, and, and, and you know, and, and I knew the you know, military thing that I also didn't, didn't bother in it. So the day before we had our so-called graduation from basic training, I was walking along. Now you you had this thing where you, you had the barracks, but then you had this really big overhang where you could have troop moving under the other. So if, if it's raining out, you know, you won't you know you won't get wet. So it was a large area, and I was walking close to the, where the offices and the barracks was, and the company commander, you know, like I, well, I never, whatever. I mean, they had, we didn't have too much con, you know, uh, con, you know, how you say, uh, contact with the company commander. It's just as you know, your, your your drill sergeants, and so he comes out, sees me, comes straight up to me, and proceeds to basically curse me out. And I'm, uh, I'm going like ah, oh. and then he scoots away. And all the cats that were standing around, they didn't run up to me, Sloan, what happened, what you do? I said, I didn't do, I don't know, I didn't do anything. I was, I was, I'm innocent, you know? And so, so that goes on. 
So, so uh, I graduate to the next thing, and then I go from where I was at, and uh, that was uh, San Antonio, whatever, uh, whatever the Air Force, the, the big thing down there in San Antonio, uh, Texas. I never went down, I never went out, and I never went out. I didn't even go see, um, what do you call that, um, the Alamo or whatever, the Bell Live and like I wasn't interested. I didn't ever left the base. In fact, I think um, Triple Man came out there and at the movie theater. Triple Man at, at, at uh, what's it? I can't remember. Whatever base that was. Oh, Lackland. Lackland Air Force Base. I think it was Lackland. I don't know where I was. Anyway, we got, I got, then, oh yeah, this must have been Lackland. And then because I got shipped up to Shepard Air Force Base, which is in you know, by the Fort Worth area, up, up northern part of Texas. Uh, Latin, but southern part of Texas, and um, and then there again, it was an interesting situation. When I came in, they said, "Okay, you're the whatever." And so I was like a basically a hotel guy uh, for the night shift. From from I think it was from they went from uh, twelve o'clock, some like twelve o'clock at night to twelve noon the next day. With my shift is twelve hour shift. I had to bring my class A's. And look really, Smith. I used to be a good looking young man. Anyway. Like as a hotel thing, that was that was interesting I uh, think too. But in that thing, in our waiting, what happened was we were waiting to get our assignment. Now I originally had assignment. I was waiting for something like a, it's basically I was a flying nurse. I was going to make me a nurse, a flying male nurse, you know, in, in the airplanes, right? But then they call a bunch of us into the room with the first sergeant, and uh, he's, we all stand around. I know so all the people there were like black and Mexican, you know, black and Spanish, you know. So I said, hmm, this is interesting. And uh, so the guy said, you all have been reassigned. So, oh, yeah, you're going to be lab technicians. That was it. <laughs> Bye. So no longer going to be a flying nurse, going to be a lab technician. Now, you have to understand, in, in, in the medical field, uh, the, the longer your school, the more, the, the harder it was, the, the more expertise you had to get, whatever have you. So in this, uh, in this situation, lab technician, it was like the second highest thing. I think the first one was a, 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 a medical equipment specialist where you fixed your medical equipment. Then the next school was really the lab technician school, which was a long school. Um, excuse me, I got a, oh, okay, use it. Sorry. So, and I was wondering why that, you know, why was this black and poor? As it ended up, affirmative, not only just affirmative action, but there was so much complaints from outside that, that that black people were getting these low end jobs. So you wouldn't ha you wouldn't have a black person being a, a lab technician. You see, it just wouldn't happen. You know, it's not, uh, yeah, tissue. It just wouldn't happen because outside that, those are those are really good. You know, solid middle class jobs or whatever happened. I guess. Well, I didn't know it at the time, but that's what happened. Excuse me. I had some warning. So that's so 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 that's what happened. I went to nine month school, you know what I mean? So I went from uh, there was a, there was Shepherd Air Force Base up top, then I went to the phase two training which we, we, oh, oh, basically in that in that school we had yeah, we're still at Shepherd. I was at Shepherd for that. I think it was Shepherd. We didn't go to Mississippi and I find out. Okay. Uh, so it was like six hours a day, six days a week. To build. And then it was like the modules, you know what I mean? You had um, parasitology, um, uh, serology, hematology, chemistry, blood banking, missing something. Um, phlebotomy, and it was a bunch of, bunch of stuff, but they were really hard courses. But the way the military, the way it does it, you know, because you just taken that course, you will learn. I remember, I remember the the the, uh, the parasitology the, the part of the chemistry. Like, no, it's parasitology uh, class when we first came in. The instructor stands up there. Just a Solomon Japonicum Paragonimus Westermani. But names of rattle all these Latin names with these you know parasites and whatever have you said. You will learn all of them. You know what I mean? Like that. Oh, okay. And we did actually. Okay. So what I learned, but but years later, what I uh, what I learned was that. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, so, so I went from there to uh, um, to Ohio, to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for my Phase 2 training, which it was was after this, this, the um, uh, six days a week, six hours a day, then you have nine months of, of working in a hospital, whatever have you. <coughs> I don't know what to tell you this before, I just a little, little aside here. When I got, when I got to, when I got to, uh, uh, 
uh, Wright Patterson. I was uh, my my friend at the time, but his name is James Slaughter. He was airman like me. So when we got to Wright Patterson, so in in the lab now in the lab, I remember say if you a patient coming in, you know, you're there, and so you, the name tag for the guy taking your blood would be like would be his name was Slaughter, so you'd be Airman Slaughter. Okay, fine. Uh, then you make jokes, oh, don't slaughter them all, whatever, you're going to do that. Okay. In the, then that's next to blood, then blood banking is right there. You go to the blood, it's right there. So the blood bank, the sergeant in charge of blood banking, wait for it, his name was Sergeant Blood. So he went from Airman Slaughter to Sergeant Blood. We're not through yet. <laughs> the, the parasitologist, you know, who's head of the, head of the lab, I mean, the, um, what do you call those? Uh, 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 oh, gosh, man, I'm missing, missing medical. The doctor, the pathologist. The pathologist has been such a long time. That was another life. Was <laughs> medical um, the, uh, you know, that guy does, does do all the autopsies and stuff like that. We did autopsies. His name, ready for it? Ready for it? Major Butcher. Oh, yeah, Sergeant Slaughter, Captain Blood, Major Butcher, all in the lab. It bypassing the Air Force Base. This is like 1970, like late 1970, early, early 71. Go check it out. We'll check the records. Okay. So I bring up all that. Just say so that so that's it then. Now, when I finally got to my final duty station, which was McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey, so see, I'm, I'm a Vietnam era veteran, but I never left the United States. And let me tell you, there's three classifications to me. There's three classifications. I talked to somebody like this for, for Vietnam era veterans. They are the people that were in country, meaning you fought, you was in, in Vietnam. They were your people that were in like Philippines or Germany or something like that, but out of, uh, not in country, but out of the United States. Then you're people like me, who was just in the United States the whole time. And then, uh, so you had, and it's three different realities, three different uh, stages of shell shock, if you will. I call it shell shock, like PTSD, whatever they call it these days, whatever they call it. You know what I mean, but there's, there's three separate things, a very, very interesting phenomenon. Um, anyway, so when I got to that that duty station, at the same time that I got to that duty station, and we had a new, the, the, the the medics had a new um, company commander for the medics. Now, the company commander is just an administrator; he's not a medic. You know what I mean? So and at that. But for some reason, we can't at the same time, but he didn't like me at all. I'll tell you those, some, some other stories later. But I'm gonna skip to uh, real, real, real quick. So he, he didn't like me at all. So he was always after me. I don't know why, it's just, just my personality, I guess. Well, I was always interested in stuff that was, that, that was happening on base. Now I'm gonna leave out, the, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the uh, organization that I, I involved, that I was involved with called, um, uh, uh, called Black Caucus. We, we started this organization, Black Caucus. I was one of the people that started this organization on base at McGuire Force Base at the time. It's like 1971, two, three. Uh, so, uh, 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 so, so let's leave that out. But one of the things that I did, but they had this panel. It's called a dormitory improvement panel for people, us as people living in a dormitory. Now, here's the way it goes. This is why I don't trust um, these government agencies and these panels that they set up or whatever have you. Because you have to look into the panel, see who, who's, why somebody's there. They could be just there just to pad their records or whatever, just for some reason, you know what I mean? And you don't know who they put on the panel. The reason I got on the panel, I heard about it and I said something or something like that. And they, for some, for, I don't know how I got on the panel. But I'm always interested in other things that's happening. I'm not interested in my little, I am interested in my little world, but I'm always looking outside of my little, little world, what to, well, like the thing says, to how to improve my little world. So this dormitory improvement panel sound like a good thing. So I went to this first meeting, whatever it is. I look around. First of all, there was only two people, two black people on the panel. That was me, right? And then this other, the sergeant, who, who didn't live in the dormitory, he was married, I think? Whatever it was, but he was off, 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 camp, off base housing he was part of. But everybody else on this panel was all white. They, and guess what? Let me put this this way. I'm serious. There's about 18 people on this panel. And only one person, count them, one person lived in the dorm. That was me. <laughs> And the, 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 the panel was headed by the vice base commander, which was a good thing for me because he saved my heart a couple of times against my captain. He didn't like me. It was kind of a very interesting dynamic. Get to some other time. 
But because the first thing I said in this meeting, I said, well, the first thing we need to do is do a survey, you know, of people who live in a dormitory. And, you know, I'd be willing to, you know, to write a survey and stuff, blah, blah, blah. But I had no help. The people, they didn't, nobody, anyway, so I did the survey. But it was interesting that you have, if you have 18 people on the panel and only one lives in a dormitory and you call yourself the dormitory improvement panel, what does that mean? So let me bring that down to, to, to this. I just want to bring I bring this whole Air Force story just to get to that particular point. Because even in the Air Force, uh, you you don't lose your soul. You know you don't you don't lose your whatever. You know what I mean? You still you still you. You you just have to find slicker ways to be you to get around the whatever whatever whatever. You know what I mean? So the thing about cut cutting the hair. You know, so no, we're not a movement. Whatever happened? Sorry about that. You know uh, this whole thing about me getting into be a lab. Uh, um, um, that was a reaction, and I'm sorry, we found out years later, well, I realized later, years later, the reason why that captain came out, that company commander came out of the thing when I was in basic training, is because somehow somebody must have told him, and you will not do any retaliation against that airman. You know, it was for this cutting of the hair. Somebody must have told him that, and must have went on his, because in the military, anything, as you advance in the ranks, any little thing, it's like capitalism, can knock you out. And people always look to knock you out with little, 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 little things. So obviously, somebody said, and I must have been on his record, and he must have known that this was going to affect his military career. So he was cursing me out because, well, he had to get it out before I graduated, I guess, you know what I mean? So back to what I was saying about the dormitory improvement panel. And, we, and then finally, we had our final report we had to put it out because there was some sort of deadline. And some, now here's this interesting thing. This was under the Nixon administration. Yeah, this is the, I don't know what yeah, that's right. This is under the Nixon administration. Um, so what also happened in that situation under the Nixon administration, they had a black guy that was in charge of just like Clarence, just like not Clarence Thomas, but who's the who's the who's the sleepy eyed neurosurgeon in the Trump administration? Well, that guy, the head of HUD, whatever his guy's name is. I mean, uh, he was like that. This guy was the head of HUD. They came to the dormitory improvement panel. He was, the head. but he was a black guy. It was kind of interesting because the way they treated him when they came in. He was. I'm always suspect. This happened when I, uh, this doctor that wanted to give me this operation that I didn't take when I was when I was had my little incident with the C. There's this way these these important guys they'll have a trench coat right and they have their suit on but they have the coat just be wrapped around their thing and they have the assistants help take them coat off like a cape you know what I mean like that it was very interesting so this guy came in like that people take his coat he, was there, he wasn't there for long he said something 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 didn't talk to me or anybody else or anything that that and on his way out didn't even say to walk I can see him right now put the coat over him, and he leaves. So it's like a, almost like a photo op. Went to visit the troops, you know, talked about in, 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 in housing of the troops or something like that, and that was, he was off like that. So I, I learned a couple of things. One, people are not interested in your know, whatever you're, you're doing. Even if you have a written report, they're not interested in that at all. You know what I mean? Two, the officials that come is only a photo op, and they don't really, they don't really, as far as I've seen, from my experience, they don't talk to you. They don't talk to anybody of importance. Or of significance, I should say. They don't do that. It's just a for in and out, in and out, in and out. And so I never trust these panels. So we have a panel for ADOS, and they say this person going to be in a panel. That, you know, there's, there's seven white people on this panel, and, and none of them are, are, are ADOS, or, they're, or there's, uh, there's there's black people on it, but not they're not ADOS. I'm highly suspect of that. That's one of the things I'm really, really. Um, peeved about, is that how these people are jockeying, jockeying like this, this other group, this uh, um, whatever their, their group is, it was famous for this, this guy, this weasel his way, and so no, we're, origin, we're the original, just whatever group it is for, for not ADOS, whatever, they're, they're in Cobra, I think, yeah, in Cobra. This famous thing, they don't, on Joy Reid, uh, you had um, the woman that's now doing the HR 40 on it with this in Cobra guy, and you can tell what they're trying to do, and of course, Barbara Lee, you know, the Lee woman, she uh she's not ADOS either, you know what I mean? So they're gonna try to pack this panel they have for HR forty, you know, with non ADOS people, with people who are, are long have been in the field but have done nothing for 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 descendants of chattel slavery. Uh, plus you have this whole thing with this whole political appointment. I think the president gonna point three people and whatever, all kinds of things. So this this HR forty panel is gonna be totally trumped up, you know, so but, but, and even now people are saying, Well you should have this. They're going by names with people, you know what I mean? They're not, I mean, I had this one thing they said, well, put Tariq Nasheed on it, put, um, uh, um, I forgot, some, some other some other people on but you can tell these are, 
these are people that you are on YouTube or whatever it is. You know, uh, there's there's this sister, uh, this lawyer sister that I got uh, turned into that I think she should, definitely should be on it. Like I don't know, if she, I think she's ADOS. Anyway, the point is, if you're gonna have ADOS thing, you don't create a panel, you know, of say of 18 people and only one person is ADOS. You know, so it's going to be interesting if they if this HR 40 goes through, what happens with that? But I say scrap. Now say scrap HR 40. But I say all these this presidential seat is very important because all the people is running, whether you're in Congress and what you are, whatever you should be writing your reparations, you know, paper. You know, all the all, all the senators should be writing your res, your, rep, your rep, reparations resolution that you want people to sign on to, and then you should present that to um to to the noble conference in in, in October, uh, for ADOS. Let's see what we think about it, and even the, even the conference. Remember the conference. One of the things the conference should be doing is basically sussing out almost like a constitution. I mean, uh, you know, so 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 it's, it's 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 really really important that we get that done. But one last thing on this on whatever panel is going to be um, appointed. One of the things everybody talks about. Um, I'm sitting here in South Africa. And they told you know everybody's famous this truth and Recon Recon reconciliation committee that they had you know the famous the famous person you know in there is is, uh, is Bishop Tutu you you know that guy you know him crying you know his rings he's crying about blah, 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 blah. but on that panel remember this is taking taking testimony from all over the country from all over different different people but you know but you always have these lawyers and whatever on the panel you don't have a uh -oh, you don't have a, 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 a a street person on that panel. You don't have a um, the, the 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 guy that's fallen on hard times, but he used to be a a, a school teacher on that panel. You, you know, these panels are always a, a prestige of people who know each other. And people don't live in that world. So they that, that truth and reconciliation reconciliation committee that shut down. They didn't go through all the whole country. They shut down after a while because I think it was that the people couldn't take it. The, those those hoity toity that they've experienced. That they really couldn't take this. Uh, what the, what they were hearing because this was the nitty gritty from the from the ground you know what I mean and they couldn't take it I think that's why it was shut down so I'm saying the same thing for this kind of panel it has to be complete thing that's for the panel thing I say money should come right away for some other things we won't get into that right now so there's the problem that I have with with, with, with systems or whatever have you first we have to examine the system and who examines it it's not just the lawyers who who invented the system you have to have artists you know what I mean like like your Arthur Millers, you know what I mean? Like to, to, to look at this thing and say, let me let me make it plain to the people by putting it in their area and explain to people what's really going on. You see, people like audio audio dramas, we should, we, poets, you know, uh, whatever. They, we should all all kinds of stripes should be doing, and not just from one cast. I'm just going to say cast. Forget this class, but cast of people. Not from just one cast of people to control everything. That's the problem. On these panels, on these, on these committees, or whatever have you, you know, I mean, the reason why Alexander Ocasio Cortez is so uh, different is because these, she didn't come through the same route that all these other people come through. So, so she's, she's not, you know, uh, transfixed by, you know, power, or whatever have you. She's here to do a job. She does her job, you know, whether you agree with her or not. That's, that's what she does. And a lot of people don't agree with it. That's why you got, you know, her own party sniping against her because they didn't want any, any other people, any other authentic people going into these committees. Okay, so I mean that's a little uh, how do you say that? Um, well, a little opinion piece for me. Anyway, so listen, I want to tell you that whole story because these people like Clarence Thomas, these are people that say they never, uh, uh, you know, affirmative action, whatever, never did anything for them. Well, they're just absolutely not true. You know what I mean? Because with the street action, with everybody on all levels moving at the same time, right now we have this ADOS movement. People don't realize that this is a foundation movement for worldwide insurrection. The, the world is insurrecting right now, but we're just another voice. And but what happens is, 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 especially a black American voice, what happens is a lot of people look at us a lot. And, and remember, the, the let me tell you, I've traveled the world. The world is still a patriarchal world. I mean, here we got this whole thing with the whatever whatever's happening with the with all this whatever confusion. But in, in the patriarchal world and all the Afri other people, people are looking at what black men are doing, 
This is what's so important, what black men are doing, what ADO's black men are doing. We're not, and, and I'm talking specifically black men. I'm not talking about, you know, whatever sexual proclivities people, I'm not talking about gender thing, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, politicians. Black men on the street, your your real fighters, not even pundits, you know, the, your Michael, the people, no, no, no. That, that, that's not people looking at. They say, who's running this thing? Who's doing it? And they want to look at authentic black men. That's what they're looking at around the world. So if you if you if you want the Yemenis to rise up, if you want the Peruvians to rise up, if you uh, if, if, believe me, the Indonesians are looking, seeing what's going. On. All the all the, 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 the regular the, the, the people that on down down on the, in the trenches. That's who's looking at this thing, and they're not and they're looking at the black men. What black men are doing. That's what our our, our thing is. And I'm talking men of all generations. You know what I mean? And so that's our biggest challenge right now. To me, our biggest challenge is not to identify, but to, el to, to, to have all our voices have to come together. We have to be, uh, like I said, I mean, I, I'm guided by a nearly full of juniors for his personal code as far as, as ADUS, where that's going, which is a political movement. I, I have to listen to, to progenitors of, of that, you know, as Yvette Cornell, Antonio Moore, and see where, where, where they want this thing to happen, according, including their network of people. That's how we get our marching orders, our political marching orders, and we get our personal code, you know what I mean? Within that thing, to me, comes some nearly full of genius. So I use those two, just those two things to, to define me. Believe me, I have a lot of other stuff I could use because of you know, a lot of other things, but I have to leave that, I have to leave that be for now, like I'm famously saying. I, I, I have I have a Pan-African body, but right now my mentality is ADOS, and I need everybody. In that. No, I don't need that, but you know, because I don't need no followers. But but you should be thinking about that. What is your personal code that makes you a, 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 an effective warrior? And then all all the all that major this warrior, what, what, what your, your mentality is is taking your mentality, your ADOS mentality is taking all those things, those na those black nationalist things, those Pan African things, and, and fortune it into a political thing. Because remember, Pan African is what they say it's, it's not a, a, a political force for 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 changing uh, the American political system. You know, nationalism again is a reactionary force. I'm saying reactionary force against a against a system not co-opting or whatever, not sp spook or sat by the door of, of that system. So ADOS is a clear political system that that that's just that's here right now, which are these other people haven't had. You know, they just haven't had. Okay. I know it's been long, sorry, but I had to get all that stuff up because it's just the way it is. From here, 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 at a desk of the ADOS from uh, from me, T from the Patterson is taking the train to to Tibet, letting you know what I only suspect. Woof, cold here in South Africa. Thank you.